Hello, my name is Jeanette and this is my channel Karma Rising. Today I am going to be talking about a case that honestly just really breaks my heart and I think it's one of the most egregious child disappearance cases of recent times and that is the case of the disappearance of seven-year-old Kyron Horman. My heart just aches for his mother Desiree. I've seen her on all kinds of daytime talk shows and murder mystery shows, that sort of thing, talking about her son and the search for him. It's been over 10 years and she still continues the search for him as any mother would. So what exactly happened to Kyron? This is what we know. On June 4th, 2010, seven-year-old Kyron Horman disappeared from Skyline Elementary School in Portland, Oregon. Oregon is basically just forests, a lot of it is, so it's very vast. And so to search for this little boy was quite an undertaking. Where did Kyron go? Could someone have taken him? Or maybe he just wandered off? To understand this case fully, you have to go back to Kyron's early life super early before he was born. Kyron Horman was the son of Desiree Young and Kane Horman, who was an engineer at Intel. So while Desiree was pregnant with Kyron, she and Kane were having some domestic issues. So when Desiree was eight months pregnant, they ended up getting a divorce. The reason given for the divorce was irreconcilable differences. Can you imagine being eight months pregnant and getting a divorce? Like what kind of irreconcilable differences could you be having at eight months pregnant? This should be a happy time filled with getting ready for your baby and not worrying about divorce and all that goes along with that. You can only imagine how Desiree felt. I read somewhere that she initiated the divorce against Kane because he had been cheating on her, but he denies that and says that he didn't start dating anybody or wasn't with anybody until after they had already separated. So that's basically a he said, she said. So on September 9th, 2002, Kyron Horman is born in Portland, Oregon. For two years after Kyron's birth, Kane and Desiree shared custody of Kyron. Unfortunately, in 2004, Desiree started developing some kidney failure and other medical issues and had to be in and out of the hospitals. So at that point, she and Kane decided it would be better for Kyron to be with Kane because he had a little bit more stable of a situation at that point. Desiree was still in Kyron's life a good amount, though she did live about four hours away in Medford. Desiree cannot get a break, this poor woman. So fast forward to 2007, Kane ends up marrying the woman who he either cheated on Desiree with or didn't cheat on Desiree with in Kauai. Isn't that just so nice for them? Mm. In 2008, Terry gives birth to daughter, Kiara. So they are just a perfect little happy family in the Pacific Northwest, living their best life. So on June 4th, 2010, which is the day that Kyron ends up going missing, his stepmother, Terry, was driving him to school. As I had said, he had that science fair that morning and he had done an awesome exhibit about red eye tree frogs that he was so excited to show his stepmother. So at the science fair, she took some pictures of him, his little face. He's just so excited. He's just such a little sweetheart. You can just see it in his eyes. So Terry says she left the school at 845 and the last time she saw Kyron was when he was walking towards his first class, a math class. However, he never arrived for that class and was marked absent for the day. So Terry goes about her day, runs some errands, goes to the gym, yada, yada. And then she heads home at 1.30 ish. She posts the pictures she took of Kyron and his science fair exhibit on Facebook. At 3.30 p.m., 
she and Kane take Kiara and they head to the bus stop to go pick up Kyron off the bus. They are told by the bus driver that Kyron never got on the bus that day and they immediately call the school to find out where Kyron is. So Terry calls the school and that is when they find out that Kyron was absent the entire day from school. Not good. So the secretary immediately hangs up and she dials 911 because she knows what this means. So immediately an Amber Alert goes out and the search for Kyron is on. They searched extensively in the area around Skyline Elementary School in what amounted to be about a two mile radius around the school. They also searched an island that was six miles away, Salvi, Salvi Island, as well as a bridge and the Salvi Island Bridge. And they never gave a reason as to why they searched this bridge. For five days following Kyron's disappearance, there was radio silence from the family. They didn't speak to the media at all. After that, they released the following statement. Kyron's family would like to thank people for their support and interest in finding their son. The outpouring of support and continued effort strengthens their hope. We need for folks to continue to assist us in our goal. Please search your properties, cars, outbuildings, sheds, etc. Also check with neighbors and friends who may be on vacation or may need as in assistance in searching. There are a lot of resources here to help you search, so please don't stop. It is obviously a difficult time and the family want to speak to the public so they can hear it from Kyron's family as they come together to share their message. Their objective is to keep the focus on Kyron and not about anything else. The search for Kyron continued to ramp up all the way through June 12th when they ended up having 300 trained rescuers searching in that area immediately around the school. At this point, they're hoping to find him alive. That's very clear. They're hoping that he's just a curious little boy and he just wandered off from school and they're going to find him. You know, maybe dehydrated, tired and scared, but they're going to find him. This was a massive search. Something like 1,200 people participated overall in the initial few days to search for Kyron Horman. So as often happens in criminal investigations, the immediate family are the first people who are questioned, which as a mom, that's what I want. Like question me, let's get it over with so we can move on and find my child. Please, let's do it right now. What do you need from me? You really would have nothing to hide. Why? Why would you hide anything? Let's find my child, please, right now. This was Desiree. Not the case with Terry. During Terry Horman's initial interview with the police, she describes what she did on that day. She says that after she left the school, she went to two different Fred Meyer supermarkets until about 10, 10 a.m. From then until 11.39 a.m., she was driving her car around with her daughter Kiara in the back trying to soothe her because she had a toothache, which parents often do. Just do the, the movement and the sound of the car and the traffic can help children fall asleep. Like if you remember being in the car as a kid and you just fall asleep really easy. It's, it's a little, little secret. Not so secret. Secret. Then she heads to the gym and she works out until 12.40 p.m. And at that point she heads home and that's when she posts the picture of Kyron and she and Kane head to the bus stop where there is no Kyron. So during the initial investigation, they had held a press conference with all four of the parents, Kane and Desiree, and then the step parents, Terry and Desiree's husband, Tony. The point of this press conference was obviously to have the public assist in helping to find Kyron and get his picture out there. So there is footage at this press conference of all of the parents standing together and Desiree looks so uncomfortable. So first of all, she is plopped right next to Terry at one point when her husband goes up to speak and Terry does this thing. Terry reaches out and puts her grubby little arm around Desiree. 
Hello, uh, my name is Tony Young, and I'm Kyron's stepfather. Now, I'm sure at this point, Desiree is, like, cool with pickups and drop-offs with Terry or whatever, but they're not, like, going to Las Vegas for the weekend. They're not BFFers at all. This is the woman that Desiree believes her husband was cheating on her, and which led to her divorce when she was eight months pregnant. So, guarantee, not a huge fan, probably. I just can't even... Let's re-roll it. Re-roll it. This bitch. Okay. So the whole time, Terry is just acting weird, like over dramatizing her grief. She just is making like sad faces and she has her face all burrowed into her husband's chest and all the other parents are just obviously in shock and she just seems like she's acting the way a grief-stricken step-parent should act, if that makes sense. Everything just seems weird. Terry is being weird, and Desiree can just tell something is off. Something's just wrong. And then it gets even weirder. So, Kyron disappeared on June 4th, early June. In the end of June, Kane ends up getting a call from, from investigators about something suspicious that Terry has done. He is told that in January 2010, Terry had approached their landscaper to essentially kill him. The landscaper, Rodolfo Sanchez, says that Terry had offered him, quote, a lot of money to off her husband. Sanchez testified in a deposition that this happened, which a deposition is extremely legally binding. You do not want to be caught lying in a deposition. If you do, then you're basically committing perjury, which is a very serious offense. You don't, don't do it. That's, it's a bad idea. But when Terry's attorney straight up asked Sanchez if she had asked him to kill her husband, Sanchez said no. So, anyway, investigators ultimately convinced Sanchez to put a wire on and try to get Terry to talk, but nothing ended up coming out of those, those wires. It just was a bust, basically. Kane wasn't having any of it, though. He immediately files a restraining order against his wife. He was also pretty quickly granted a divorce and full custody of his daughter, and Terry only got supervised visitation, which I'm sure pissed her off even more, but don't try to have your husband killed, you know? So now all of that nonsense is going in, and Kyron is still missing. The investigation into his disappearance is ongoing, and Terry is given two separate polygraph examinations, and she failed both of them. So at this point, they start subpoenaing Terry's friends to see what they know. Kane described several of her friends as providing her with support and advice that is not in the best interests of our son. And that included her close friend, Dee Dee Speichers. I think that's how you say her last name. Now, Dee Dee did some sketchy stuff too. On June 4th, 2010, Dee Dee left work at 11.30 a.m. and didn't return for 90 minutes and just suddenly left, which if you look at Terry's timeline of just driving around randomly until 11.30 and then being at the gym, it's kind of suspicious the way it lines up. Dee Dee also purchased Terry an untraceable cell phone, which if you're unfamiliar is one of those phones you can get at like a gas station or at Walmart and they're 30 bucks. They call them track phones. They're often used by drug dealers or people who can't afford to have a contract and so they just use them and you can throw them away and it's, it's not as much of an investment as like Verizon or something like that. They're often used to elude the authorities, and there's not really a good reason that Dee Dee had for getting this for Terry, so. Despite this, Dee Dee was very cooperative with the police. She let them search her property, and she also underwent something like three hours of interrogations, so. I just don't know. 
So then it comes out in August 2010 that law enforcement is now looking for someone who was seen inside Terry's truck at the elementary school on the day that Kyron had gone missing. This person was seen by two witnesses. Terry, come on. I cannot stand this woman. She's just so sketchy. In August of 2010, both Kane and Terry, as well as the principal of Kyron's school, were subpoenaed for a grand jury in this case. The grand jury ultimately did not find enough evidence to indict anybody. This entire case has just got to be a nightmare for both of these parents, but especially Desiree. She left her son in the care of her ex-husband and this woman... And then she goes through all this health problems and then her son disappears. Like that's not her fault, but man, must she feel guilty. In June, 2012, Desiree filed a civil lawsuit against Terry, basically claiming that Terry was responsible for the disappearance of Kyron. The lawsuit alleged that Terry had kidnapped Kyron on that day and it sought $10 million in damages. So then in October, 2012, Dee Dee Speicher, remember old Dee Dee, she was depositioned regarding this case and she refused to answer 142 questions. A lot of them regarding whether she knew Kyron and Kane or anything about this case. Dee Dee and Terry know something, I'm just saying. They definitely do. So in July 2013, Desiree dropped her case against Terry, citing that she was worried that it could have some potential negative outcome on the case of Kyron's disappearance in that investigation. And that is kind of where the case stands today. Um, there's been a lot of media appearances by all of the parents. Some noteworthy appearances include a 2013 appearance on Dr. Phil in which both Kane and Desiree appear. This is the first time they were seeing each other for three years, essentially since the search concluded for uh, Kyron. And the exchange gets pretty spicy. Why have y'all not spoken in three years? Do you, do you blame him for this? Do you think he should have seen something? I don't blame Kane for Kyron's disappearance. I want to make that very clear. However, the things that I have a hard time with is the fact that I feel like things were happening in the year prior to Kyron going missing that I was bringing attention to. And I don't know if you were busy with your life or what was going on, but it was just ignored. And I feel like in that, we failed Kyron. We didn't protect him. That's, that's interesting. A lot of the dialogue was more between you and Terry than you and I. She made deliberate attempts to put herself in the middle of the communication. So your emails, I never saw your emails. Her and I never spoke about them. Okay, I, I didn't even know about it. And I, I'm glad that's coming out here today. And I, and I want to be clear that right now, Terry is not a suspect. She's not a person of interest as far as the police are concerned. She hasn't been charged with anything. And you have said you do not believe that Cain has hurt your son in any way. You do have angst about how he couldn't see. He may not have read the emails, but did, did Terry hide this from you? Did you ever see her being annoyed with him, short with him, neglectful of him? Looking back, did you miss things? I, I think absolutely I did. I think at the time the economy was, was going a really bad direction for all of us. I was focused on work. I was focused on all of a sudden we had a daughter, a new daughter coming that wasn't expected. We had a lot of things that were happening in life and I spent a lot of my time focused on my kids and focused on my job and I didn't focus on her and that I definitely should have spent more time. But I've also, in hindsight, in all the discussions I have with other people, most normal people aren't investigating their spouse on a day-to-day -day basis. Of course. Now, recently, there was a request to, I guess, dig up or excavate your property, your yard. Oh, search, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yep. And you said no. Yes. And that bothered you? 
Yes, definitely. Okay, why would you not? I have an open invitation with law enforcement and the search and rescue teams, the certified search and rescue teams, to search my property any day, any time. When I was called, I said no to the private search, but I, I immediately said, and I will continue to say right now, any time, any time the sheriff's office and the search and rescue teams want to come with their dogs, it's already, my property, I'll qualify with, my property's been searched more than the school has probably. And my invitation is open, always open. I'm glad for you to say you're willing to have that search any time. And, and you're not saying that you want to search because you think he did something wrong. You're just saying some, there could be evidence there. I want oh, to be very clear. Oh, I believe clear. it would have been a great opportunity for Terry. She wouldn't have been seen by anybody. It's just so sad to see them together. The one thing that bound them together is missing, and you can see the pain on Desiree's face. In 2015, a reporter with True Crime Daily, which used to be Crime Watch Daily, Jason Matera, joined Desiree on a search for Kyron in the vast Oregon wilderness. Today, it's led me here. Obviously, we're looking for skeletal remains. I'm joining over 50 volunteers, some of them Desiree's family, others complete strangers from as far away as Florida to mark the fifth anniversary of Kyron's disappearance with a search for clues. If you find something, do not touch it, do not pick it up, do not mess with it, back up and make sure you call command. This is not just trying to find Kyron and bring him home. It's about making sure justice is done also. Today's search grid is based on new information Desiree recently received from confidential sources. Those tips have led you to this location? Uh, yeah, this location and several others, yeah. You're compelled to search for Kyron, but do you dread what you may find? Absolutely, yeah. Um, when I go out in the morning, I, um, I hope we find something and then I don't. What are you hoping to find? Answers. <laughs> um, we know it. we think she did that day. It's hard for a mom to know that. It's my sweet little Kyron. It's easy to see why Desiree is so disheartened. Finding anything in this dense and rugged rainforest seems almost hopeless. But then, while our cameras are rolling, a volunteer cries out. Traffic bone. What? Someone's uncovered a bone. We gotta get somebody out here. Suddenly, we're holding our collective breath, knowing this could be the evidence we've been both dreading and hoping for. In 2010, Kyron Horman, a second grader from Portland, Oregon, disappeared without a trace. Could these dark and mossy woods be the final resting place of the boy whose smile touched the hearts of so many? In this Crime Watch Daily exclusive, I've been asked by Kyron's mother, Desiree, to join in on a search based on new evidence. And it seems we may have just found something. What? The discovery is both thrilling and sobering. Well, regardless, we're going to have to get somebody out here. Yeah. So we've located a bone right here, two bones, actually, and now we're trying to identify if the bone is part of a human remains. So we're going to get some experts here to determine what exactly we are looking at. Fearing the worst, Desiree is led away from the scene. She doesn't need to see any part of that. You know, she, she's doing everything. She wants to be part of everything. She wants to find her son, regardless. But that's, that's a harsh reality. And what motivates you to search year after year for Chiron? Chiron, his family. I'm sure you guys have sensed it. The second you get near him, you, you, you feel their pain. You, you feel it. And I just want to do anything I can to help bring him home. I mean, he's just a little boy. Before long, a professional search and rescue team arrives on scene. Uh, it's about 10 and a half inches long. Potentially would be a femur if it was anything. <laughs> so Dennis, what's the protocol now? If you could explain that to us. Um, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna send it to actually our national search director. They have a human remains detection area. 
if, if they say it's something that the Shav the dogs come look at, they will. A team of cadaver dogs are indeed called to the area. And what's her name? This is Delilah. Delilah, okay. She knows it's time to go to work. Go girl, here, front. These search and rescue canine units are specifically trained to sniff out human decay, whether that's flesh or blood or even bones. And as you can see, that's what this particular canine unit is doing now in the search for Chiron. The search is difficult and painstaking, but understanding the reason we're all here drives everyone to keep going. Back at the command post, the tension is palpable. When there are remains found and cadaver dogs sent in, what's it like? It's an absolute roller coaster when you come across something like that, any member, especially a family member, your heart stops, your breathing stops, and you, of course, the family is wondering if that's their child, is that Chiron? Ultimately, the bones we discover turn out not to be human after all. It's news that Desiree greets with the combination of relief and sadness. That moment when they find a bone, it's just chilling can physically feel the agony in Desiree. And if, if you have a child, you understand that pain. This is, as a parent, this is literally your worst nightmare. Searching through the woods for your children's bones. <sighs> so then in 2016, Terry appears on the Dr. Phil show, basically trying to clear her name. I guess Time has passed and we have to deal with the reality. As time passes, odds go down. But I'm curious, what do you think happened to Kyron? I think that somebody came in the school and took him. Uh, one of the exonerating things that people don't, our public's not made aware of, is the day before on June 3rd, when I was completely someplace else at the doctors and at the gym, uh, there was a man in a white pickup truck, uh, Ford, and it was parked at 7-Eleven on Highway 30, which is near the school. He was acting very strangely, and he was uh, addressed by one of the employees there that came out and asked him what he was doing because he had been passing, um, pacing back and forth in front of the 7-Eleven for about an hour. And he was, went over to find out what was going on, and the guy I'm not sure what the entire conversation was about, but I do know from, the, from a couple of these witnesses that uh, this man asked the employee where the nearest school was, and that employee told him Skyline, and this is the day before. Um, when the, um, after all of this happened, uh, the other, another employee that was working there that day, she had contacted the police and said, hey, there was this strange guy here. We've got a tape of it. Would you like to come see it? The cops went over there, they viewed the tape, and she asked them, would you, would you like the tape? And they said, no, we're good. They didn't even take the tape. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these are witnesses that um, say otherwise. As far as what my concern is, that, that somebody else has come into the school, it was open. Uh, the, the, the protocol is you're supposed to have only the front door unlocked, and all the doors were unlocked. And roughly, from what I understand, about 400 people came in and out of that school. No badges, no signing in or out. So, um, Do you think Kyron will ever be found alive? J.C. Dugard was. Elizabeth Smart was. So yes, I, unless, unless I am told otherwise in some way, shape, or form or shown, I'm going to always believe that he's alive and out. She is just so suspicious. So during that clip, she starts naming women like Elizabeth Smart and J.C. Lee Dugard who went missing as examples of children who went missing and came back. But the thing is, they were both kidnapped to be sexually exploited. It almost feels like she's insinuating that she thinks that he was somehow taken to be sexually exploited or like sex trafficked, which is weird. It's, it's just so messed up to say so coldly. Like this woman has no emotion. Anyway, this case is messed up on so many levels. First off, I think that Terry is legitimately the devil incarnate. I mean, you have to trust your intuition. And as my friend Becca said recently, if it smells fishy, it's probably a fish. 
I think that this woman just covered her tracks really well and she lucked out like the devil that there were no cameras in that school that caught her taking that little boy out that day because there were witnesses that said that they saw her walking him out that day of the school to her car. As for Kane, I think it's a little ironic that Kane was the catalyst for all this. I mean, he brought Terry into the situation. And if you look at the Bible, Cain in the Bible is the one that screwed his brother over and literally beat him over the head with a stone. For his own gain, too. Obviously, this is a tragedy. And I don't think Cain had anything to do with this. And I'm terribly sad for him as well. But like Desiree said, what do you expect when you invite the devil into your house? I think initially... Terry was able to seduce Cain away from Desiree, which if you look at the two of them, I mean, no judgment that all women are beautiful, but Desiree is just a knockout. She is flat out beautiful. Terry just basically seems like a homewrecker and not a very good person overall, which that just can't end well, never does. Then I think Terry got sick of her life she just wanted a new one with just her daughter and decided to off her husband, off his son, and move on with her new life. But in that relationship where it's cool for like a month or two and then like the crazy starts to come out in a big way, there's always signs of the crazy to come. Like, come on, Kane. Could have seen the signs. And lastly, Desiree. My heart goes out to this woman. She's so heartbroken over this loss and she is still searching for answers to this day. She must be such a strong soul to be put through so much and still be searching and still be fighting to find her son, which any mother should and would do. Anyway, so please comment below if you have anything else to add or um, just to throw your opinion into the ring of what you think happened to Kyron on that day. I hope that Kyron is found safe and alive soon, ideally, but if not, I hope that he is at least reunited with his mother in some capacity, God willing. This is an age progression photo of Kyron Horman. There is currently a $50,000 reward offered for any information leading to the recovery of Kyron Horman. If you have any information about Kyron's disappearance, please contact the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office tip line at 503-261-2847. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe for more content. And if you have any ideas for cases that I could cover in the future, please comment below.